Um, thank you for having me along. It's, it's strange sitting in my house, having you all listening in. Um, and what I'm worried is that you're, going to, you're all going to wander off now, leaving me talking to, in effect, an empty room. There's just going to be cardboard cutouts looking back at me. Um, at least I suppose you can't throw anything uh, at me. And um, I guess as I'm not driving, I can have a beer afterwards. So um, what I'm going to do then, my, uh, my name is Mark Radici. I'm going to talk to you about how I observe the solar system why I enjoy it. These are mostly my own photographs and I'm going to describe my own techniques and approach and try to explain why I do things a certain way and I'll include some of the highlights I've made over the recent years. Now before we start I'll assume you all know what a planet is and under the premise that you you never make an assumption I'll now explain what a planet is. So it's a spherical body, it's got to have enough gravity to be round so that rules out asteroids and comets, so they're irregularly shaped. It has to orbit the sun, so that rules out moons. And it has to swept, swept its orbit clear of other bodies. So dwarf planets such as Ceres uh, and Pluto, uh, although they are spherical and orbit the sun, because they orbit in their respective belts, the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt respectively, they are not planets, they're called dwarf planets. So you'll notice at the bottom of the screen, there is a bar of planets. Um, and I took these on the club trip when we went to Mount Tidy on Tenerife in 2018. And that's all the planets in one night uh, from that trip with that telescope. And the trip is, as you can imagine, a talk in its own right. And um, I'm sure you're aware of what, what we have uh, out there. But in addition to having access to a dome, that we have this access to this observing area. And uh, that's where we all set up, but it's, it's rather pleasant because you can get a room with a, a kettle, a fridge, there's a loo as well. So you get the, the benefits of being um, on top of the mountain in, in Tenerife, but you have all the facilities as well. So you're not on the roadside. As I was saying, I observed all the planets in one night and then wrote it up for astronomy now. So starting on the left, we've got little Mercury and Venus. You'd have the Earth as number three, and then Mars, the orange disk there. Um, and these are the four uh, with the Earth, the rocky inner worlds. You then jump a bit, you've got Jupiter and Saturn, and they're the gas giants. And then Uranus and Neptune, the two little blue ones at the end, which are so cold, the atmospheres are actually made of ices. So these are called the ice giants. So there's a picture Dave took while we were on Tenerife. It was actually very hard trying to stand still for 20 seconds. So bearing in mind when we leave, everybody's in t-shirt and shorts and I've got a down jacket on there. It just gives you an idea of what the conditions are like up at the summits compared to down at sea level. But it is an amazing place to observe with all those telescopes uh, in the background. Now you can't image all the planets in the solar system and then miss off planet number three, the Earth. And in the foreground, this large uh, mountain just up there on the left hand side is Mount Tidy, which is the highest mountain in Spain, which is strange thinking it's you know, a few thousand miles away in, uh, you know, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And this is taken at sunset, looking towards sunset. And you've got the crescent moon, Venus, Regulus and Mercury. Now, if you can see the mouse, I assume that's coming through. That yeah. is the circle, um, not the circle, sorry, the um, question mark of Leo, the sickle of Leo. So Leo's heading up, up that way and then diving down there. Um, so it's a wonderful trip. You know, we had all these planets, the planets you've just seen there. Uh, plus, of course, we, um, you know, saw some other, other sites as well uh, over, over that trip. So by way of introduction, I've always been into, into the sciences. I became um, an active observer. Well, my kids say way back when Pontus was a pilot. I worked in Canada uh, for a year before I went to university. And when I was working at a school uh, near Toronto, uh, we had a talk from an astronomer and he said, this is the perfect time to be getting into astronomy. You've got two bright comets coming along at the same time. Um, and we had Comet Hayakataki in March 96. And then in 97, we had Comet Hale-Bopp as well. And I followed this chap's advice and I borrowed a pair of binoculars and I went outside and I, I worked out where the plough was and I worked out where the comet was and found them, found, found where this comet was. And when I think back now, I think, gosh, I wish another comet's going to come back, come across the skies like, a, like either of these two. 
Um, and I think looking back through my old notebooks, I, I left the outside light on so I could see what I was doing. Um, so I think like my skills and my kit and my, my techniques have got better now. So I'd actually get far more out of it than just, uh, just what I achieved then. But this is my first proper sort of astronomical observation. And uh, I can't wait to see another comet, uh, comet like this. So since then, uh, I've, I've moved uh, to, to Salisbury. And here's my home observatory. I roll off roof in, in the garden as the sky gets dark. Uh, and I must highlight uh, that's not in real time. I don't think I can observe quite that quickly. But that's me getting my telescope ready for a night outside. And this is what we've got inside the observatory. And before we dive into the details, I must say that having an observatory is absolutely brilliant. It is so convenient. It takes me longer now to find my keys and to make a cup of tea than it does to set up. Um, it has a warm room where I spent the last few months while we work, work, work from home. But we did have a bit of a family crisis when, when this went up because um, my wife and children wanted to have a hot tub and they thought they could use the warm room uh, of the shed to get changed in. And then you could, of course, you could roll the roof back and sit out under the stars. But luckily common sense prevailed and we went for the observatory instead. So sitting on the, on the mount is a Celestron 11 inch uh, schmidt cassegrain a C11. And I'm actually imaging Venus at, 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 while we're taking that. So you can see the image of Venus down there on the laptop screen. And I used to be able to see Venus for about half an hour, 45 minutes or so. And it used to just transit through this gap in the two trees. So it's a bit like, you know, the alignment at Stonehenge. You have to be there at a precise time to, to, to catch it. Now, what I'll do then as we go through the talk, I'll talk about the kit I've got hanging off the back of the telescope and then the techniques I use to, to capture those images. Um, I'm just going to divert off further to a second bit of uh, equipment I've got. So a few years ago, I worked in Milton Keynes. I had the choice of weekend commuting back and forth. And rather than transport a telescope up there, I bought a secondhand six-inch Max Sutov. And I bought this from a lady in Bedford for £250. Um, so not cheap, but, you know, not expensive. I'm sure we can spend far more on astronomical equipment. And here I am imaging, uh, imaging the moon. Mayor Humboldt on the limb of the eastern limb of the moon. And to be honest with you, Milton Keynes, it's impossible to see anything other than the moon and the planets. Um, and so I borrowed a high speed planetary camera from a friend at Andover Astronomy Club and began sort of lunar and planetary observing. And, and really enjoyed it. And, I, and I'd moved over from being a deep sky observer more into the, lun into the moon and the planets. And I will use this telescope, the images I've, is, I've used with this telescope is as throughout the talk. First, firstly, that's to show what can be done with a good but affordable smaller telescope. But also more practically, the planets are so low and have been for, for several years now. I've yet to actually use my C11, the larger telescope in the observatory in Anger. So I'm really looking forward to Mars coming back this, this autumn. It's going to be much higher in the sky. And then Jupiter over the next year or so will start climbing higher and higher into the sky as well. So I just need to remind you then as we go through this, I'll, I'll, I'll say it several times. I bought this, this telescope secondhand from a lady in Bedford um, to, as we go through. Right, so there should be a time lapse coming through now of Jupiter. That is Io and casting a shadow and then Europa comes along as well and also casts its shadow onto Jupiter. And so that was taken with the, with the little six inch telescope. And I use this video to sort of say, this is why I enjoy observing the planets. They're dynamic, they're, they're ever changing, features come and go uh, and can be monitored by us amateurs. There's a sort of beauty, rugged grandeur of what we're looking at. And as I was saying, the, the light pollution in Milton Keynes was so bad that pretty much most of the planets are easy to find. You certainly don't need accurate go-to and star hopping. You just have to line up the crosshairs uh, to, to, to find the planets. Now, I also enjoy looking at deep sky objects, don't get me wrong, uh, but they remain unchanging. That view of M42 I had, you know, was it in the, in the late 90s when I started observing. M42, the Orion Nebula is pretty much the same as it was when I first started observing, yet the planets rotate, they have seasons, they have storms, you have this uh, satellite phenomena as well as they go, as they go around. A very dynamic world, very different from deep sky observing. I'm just going to segue off then into the, our nearest neighbor, the moon. Um, now we said earlier that moon is not a planet, 
but it does have fascinating uh, detail because it's so close to us that we can see. And the Apollo astronauts called it this uh, magnificent desolation. But I'm going to put a little fact on the table then for you. If you go outside, if, if, the sky, if the clouds allow, and had a look at the moon with your naked eye in the garden, that view of the moon is broadly equivalent to the telescopic view of the planets. So even with just a pair of binoculars, the lunar details that you get to see in a pair of binoculars are far better than what a typical scope, say, reveals on Jupiter. So when you think that view there you've got is roughly what a pair of binoculars would see. You're seeing some of these craters and the lava features and, and the floodplains. Um, you know, tel telescopes find it hard to pick up that sort of resolution detail. You certainly can see this re resolution of detail on Mars um, or, or, or Jupiter. So observing the moon because it's so close is wonderfully good fun. Um, here's a picture of the northeast corner. I think Zoom has really chewed that up looking at the picture I have on my screen. Um, and you've got this, I love this little mountain, uh, unnamed mountain with the shadows cast across with the lava floodplains uh, around us of Mare Christ and, where the, and you've got the wrinkle ridges where the lava solidified. Um, and this is evidence of, you know, planetary geology on another world. And my family will be sitting aside watching Celebrity X Factor on Ice. And here we can be outside observing, um, you know, planetary formation firsthand. So while I'm talking about the moon, I took this picture a few years ago. And when I was testing up, I thought, oh, hello, there's a bright star alongside the moon. I thought, oh, good Lord, that, that's Saturn. And I want to use this picture. Um, and I have to tell the children, don't worry, they're not going to collide. Saturn is far, far, uh, much, much further away. It's just a line of sight effect. So planets obviously much larger than the moon, but obviously much, much further away. But look at the angular size of Saturn compared to some of these craters. Saturn is smaller than, than the largest of these lunar craters. You know, you're looking down to resolving details inside a lunar crater. So I want you to bear that in mind as we go through this talk that what we're looking at are actually very small details and we need to magnify those, uh, those high resolution images. And certainly when you compare the planet to a deep sky object, and this is not my, my picture, I've got the credits there, um, and that's the moon compared to the Andromeda galaxy. I mean, Saturn would just be a pixel uh, on, this, on this picture. So please bear that in mind as I go through the talk that what we're looking at is very, very small, very, very fine details. High resolution imaging is what we're going to do. Um, and while I'm talking about the moon uh, and the planets, I did manage to get this picture, uh, which is the occultation of Mars by the moon uh, in February of this year. And it's actually the moon moving towards Mars. It, it looks the other way just because it was easier just to put lots of little dots there. So the moon moves around its orbit around the Earth and slowly moved towards Mars and got closer and closer. And it took about nine seconds from first contact to crossing the disk of Mars. And I was pretty disappointed because a few weeks ago at the end of June, we had the um, moon, the very thin crescent moon went over the very crescent, very thin crescent Venus. And the pictures on the web looked, looked amazing. Alas, it's completely clouded down here. Um, but yes, yeah, a wonderful site. And I'm going to just jump, jump in there uh, with my first recommendation is you don't need to have a telescope to do planetary observations. Um, here I am, and this is, the, this is how I took those pictures. I've got a smartphone and I've got the, the little camera mount thingy and I clamp it over the eyepiece looking down and you get a little image. And of course you can zoom in and catch those pictures there. Um, and I took this picture in Florida uh, in February of this year and you can imagine how terrible it was observing, you know, under these palm trees in t-shirt and shorts. Uh, I think it's about eight or eight o'clock in the morning, just just after sunrise. Um, but yeah, it was a real hardship this this trip. And I also used the same setup to image the moons of Jupiter. Again, just with the smartphone held up to the eyepiece, uh, using the smartphone mount, mount, and then you can go on to Stellarium or Sky Safari or look in look in the centre of the magazines. And you can identify which moon is in in which place uh, just a just a day apart they've all moved slightly further out except for little callisto which is the furthest one and i did notice those moons are actually in in order i use the the inner europa ganymede and callisto the furthest i think yeah it's unusual to see them all all lined up in in, in sort of name or so in rank order so yeah you don't need a telescope to observe the planets you can do that with a camera you can do that with an iphone and a pair of binoculars 
Now, one of the first uh, projects I did, um, sort of serious projects, I, this is in 2006, and um, Jupiter was very low at this time. And when we were living in Farnborough, I used to, well, it's back here, what's that, 9.30, yeah, 11 o'clock, so obviously British summertime. Um, I used to, our neighbours between us, we had a six foot high fence. I think, oh, it's clear. I used to put my binoculars resting on the fence and peer across and I could then estimate how many Jupiter diameters there were between Jupiter and the moon. I'd think, oh, that's roughly one. So that must be about you know, three and maybe four. So I'd say four, three, one. And then I'd you know, recognize, you know, be able to put that in a notebook. And again, just with, with the eye, you can see Callisto then just over the as, as June turns into July going around its orbit. I've, I've never bothered to work out the, the inner ones wiggling around. So I don't know what my neighbours thought as uh, about 10, 11 o'clock a pair of binoculars suddenly appeared on their on their garden fence. And I think 2018 was the last time I've really had a good session looking at Jupiter before it disappeared right down into the southern sky. It's been hidden from my garden behind the trees. And so this would be May, June time and it was nice and warm and what set up the little six inch mac at the end of the garden and I was thinking as I was in t-shirt and shorts at nine ten o'clock at night oh this reminds me of the time in 2006 when I used to go out uh, observing now at that time in May of 2006 my daughter was born first first child was born so you've actually got a, a coincidence and clear skies when I was awake at nine or ten o'clock at night and when I could be bothered to to go out and observe and I was thinking in 2018, I thought, ah, oh, this reminds me of those times, of, you know, observing Jupiter when it was so hot. And of course, that was one Jupiter year, 12 years is one Jupiter year. So Jupiter's actually gone all the way around and come back uh, to the same part of the sky again. Now, there's loads more visible uh, in the solar system with binoculars. You could track asteroids, you can track comets, uh, find the outer planets. But binoculars do have a very limited magnification. So it's not long before you realize that perhaps you want to use a telescope. And again, you don't need a camera to observe the planets. Uh, here's a sketch in 2003 with a, an old telescope I borrowed, a, a five inch refractor of Mars. Um, and the kids thought, they said, oh, that's odd, Mars has got a pair of underpants on. Um, but this is Sirtis Major, it's a large, dark uh, desert region, rocky desert region in the front. And number four in my sketch is the Hellas Basin, it's an impact basin, a large crater. And it looks bright because it has um, mist and clouds form inside Hellas and that's where a lot of the dust separates as well. So it always looks bright. Um, so you can actually see desert features on Mars. You've got the polar ice caps up here as well. And as they melt, they leave this dark band uh, as the seasons change. So I can say hand on heart, I have seen the polar ice caps of Mars. I've seen impact basins on Mars. And I've seen the desert features on Mars. Um, and all this with just pencil and, and, and paper. But it's not long, I say, before you want to start uh, putting a camera on there. And I find that with a camera, I can reveal far, far more than I can with, with an eyepiece. Um, and I say, I took these pictures with the, with the little six inch you saw earlier. And um, the first is Jupiter in 2016. And I say, don't forget, this is with a telescope I bought secondhand from a lady in Bedford, in the Asda in Bedford, meeting in the car park. And there is details inside the great red spot on Jupiter. And you've got all this wonderful details around the wake and in the northern equatorial belt as well. And the second picture is, was taken on that trip to, in Tenerife in, in 2018. And Mars, you can see, is very washed out. There's just some hinting of dark markings here and a little bit of a polar ice cap there. And Mars was actually covered in a complete global dust storm. So not just a regional dust storm, they actually went all the way around Mars uh, across all uh, lines of longitude. And our last few days of our trip um, in, in on Tenerife, we had a dust storm blow across from Africa and washed out all the stars. So I've actually observed a dust storm on Mars through a dust storm on the Earth. And so the next part of the talk, then I'm going to go through how I go about making images, how I go about making observations like this. Um, so oh, I'll jump back to stage. Sorry. And this picture here is the infrared image. So this is optical light, and this is in the infrared with an infrared filter. And you can see that you can just start to see more of the surface markings there. The, the light through the infrared can penetrate the dust better than the optical light. So you can just start to see hints of, hints of details there when I swap the filters over.
So I mentioned earlier the um, planets are very small, they're very bright or relatively bright. And we know that deep sky images, um, you, you take many, many long duration exposures of what is this quite faint but quite large stuff that you stack together. And when we observe the, the planets, what we're actually doing is, is, is the opposite. Because our targets are so small and bright, what we're going to do is do high resolution imagery uh, of that. I'm going to just have a little jump away first. And the big problem we've got here with, with planetary observing is the atmosphere. Now, you can't deny the atmosphere is rather useful for life, but it becomes really hard for astronomy, particularly if there's a bright comet in the morning sky that we want to go and see. Now, when we're doing high resolution imaging, the light from the planet travels for hours across the vacuum of space. And in the microsecond it takes to cover the 100 kilometers from the top of the atmosphere to ground level, that wavefront gets distorted and it gets broken up by air currents in the atmosphere, a variety of sources. Um, and I always find it such a shame because it's just that last little fraction of a second. It's, you know, just a, a microsecond of time and the light's all broken up. And this is a, a feature we call seeing. So you'll hear astronomers talking about nights of good seeing when the atmosphere is relatively still. And there are nights when the seeing is, is very poor and the, the thing is just a dancing blob and you can't see any, any fine details at all. So there's two parts to uh, seeing. One is the atmosphere itself and the jet stream or changes in, in weather zones can, can have that effect. You also have local environment effects as well. And I can see the difference certainly if I observe in the front of the house looking over towards to the south. Um, if the planet goes behind um, the sort of the outflow of a chimney or uh, our neighbor's chimney from their, from their uh, heating system, you can see that image get broken up as well. And certainly between a hot day, you've got the heat rising off the roof as, as the night air cools. And the other thing is, well, you can get tube currents inside the telescope itself. So if you keep, if I was to keep my telescope outside, and I think back to being in Milton Keynes where I didn't have an observatory and I kept my telescope indoors and say indoors it's 20 degrees C and I put it outside in the garden, it might be zero degrees C outside or less in the winter. Then of course you get a heat plume coming off that, that mirror. Uh, you get a heat haze rising up of that as well. So in Milton Keynes, I used to put my, where I didn't have an observatory, I didn't have a garage, I used to put the telescope in the car uh, when I got back from work, just to let it cool down for an hour or two. So when I went and then set up, at least it uh, had reached that sort of uh, equilibrium with the environment. So you want to minimize tube currents by allowing the optics uh, to reach ambient before you start observing. And my other advice as well is to avoid heat sources. So if you've got a laptop and you're imaging, then make sure that's behind the open end of the telescope, keep that behind the telescope. And even yourself, you'll still be producing a warm current, your, your body temperatures was at 39.7 degrees C, outside air temperature might be 5, 10, might be less than that. And again, that's going to produce heat as well. So make sure all these heat sources are behind the telescope. So you, you don't break up that, that optical wave fronts coming in the front end. So what we, I use is a technique called lucky imaging. And this is where I rely on moments of clarity, moments of random clarity, I rely on luck to produce a high resolution image. So before we go outside, uh, I downloaded the software. It's all free, it's all, all freely available. It's all used by uh, amateur astronomers around the world. And I use fire capture to capture the image. Auto stacker, it's a Dutch, Dutch name, that's why it's, a, it's the stacker. And that sorts and stacks uh, images and then registers stacks to sharpen. And the technique I use is, is to capture very fast, short exposures. And I'm going to talk you through a, a video footage I've got of Jupiter. And I was capturing this at 200 frames per second. So very much faster than what a, a deep sky observer would be using. And in two minutes, I've captured 24,000 frames, so 200 frames a second. And what the software will do, the auto stack it will do, it will reject all the blurry ones and stack one on top of the other, the sharpest ones. And from that, we can then process because we've stacked it, we've reduced the noise. Now, when I take my telescope into schools or to clubs, people will say, what's the best telescope I can have? What's the best telescope? And we always say, if, if money was no object, you, we would all have our own Hubble because we're up above the atmosphere. We don't have to worry about any of these, any of these effects. 
But of course, in a more practical sense, it's sort of relying on lucky, lucky imaging, where the technique relies on just random moments of clarity. It's actually a much more affordable approach. So here I am set up on, on Mount Tidy. I've got a telescope uh, cooling down as the air temperature drops. It's on a tracking mount. Now we mentioned earlier that the planets are small, so we're going to put a Barlow lens in, so we get a nice big image. And although you can image the planets with, with, a, with a Dobsonian mount, with an untracking mount, it does become a real nightmare because of course the planet moves across the field of view. So you've got to realign the telescope, wait for it to drift across the field of view and then realign and let, wait for it to drift across the field of view. So I, I really recommend using a tracking mount. Doesn't matter if it's equatorial or out azimuth along here, the exposures for planetary imaging is so short, we don't have to worry about field rotation. And I've also got my laptop inside this cardboard box with the software already installed and it's inside the cardboard box because we weren't allowed stray light to affect the other facilities as well. Now I'm not going to give a processing tutorial but I'm more than happy to to take questions otherwise we'll be here all night um, but I, I, if you do have any questions then don't hesitate to ask afterwards. So remember we're capturing Jupiter at 200 frames per second. I'm waiting for this video to start playing here it comes. So this is the video I took of Jupiter. Hopefully that's coming through and you can see that. And you'll notice you get moments, you know, it's quite good, but it blurs out, the fine detail blurs away. Uh, and that's, that's the effect of the scene. You can see the image, the limb dances back and forth. Now this is good seeing. This was on top of, of, of Tidy. So this is much better than I normally get back home. But you can see the effect the atmosphere has and just jumping that image around. But your eye and your brain are actually quite good. And you suddenly say, oh, hang on, there's, there's a little bit of detail there um, alongside the great red spot. I can see there's a, maybe something along here in the equatorial zone. And your eye and your brain are actually quite good. And, and certainly until uh, this approach, this high-speed webcam sort of approach to planetary imaging came along, sketching was actually much better than film photography for capturing fine details. So I use fire capture to capture my, my images of, 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 in this case, of Jupiter. And I get the focus as sharp as I possibly can. I often catch, let's say, maybe four or five, two minutes exposures, two minute sets of video, and just dial it in and just make sure that hopefully I've got an absolutely perfect focus. So the next thing to do is to put it in this program called AutoStack at the Dutch, made by a Dutch astronomer. Now this is Venus, this was taken the other side. I realized I didn't have a, a print screen of using the Jupiter uh, footage. Now AutoStackit sorts all the pictures you've taken, all those individual frames at 200 frames per second from the sharpest to the blurred. And what you do is you then tell it how many of those sharp pictures you want to stack one on top of the other. And it then does something a bit clever as well. It calls these alignment points. And what it does, it breaks the image into these little squares and searches in the sharpest frames for the sharpest part of each frame and then recombines them back together inside uh, that. So it's a bit like doing a jigsaw, ser searching for the sharpest piece then putting the jigsaw back together. So it's quite some, quite some advanced maths going on in the background there. Um, so, so auto stack it stacks, sorry, sorts and then stacks and rejects the blurry ones. So you then end up with a sharpest frame. Now this is the sharpest frame of that 24,000 or so, but you can see it's very grainy it's, um, you know, it's got this sort of salt and pepper, gritty sort of appearance. And that's because the noise is very high. If you remember, we were catching this at one two hundredth of a second. So there's not a lot of, there's the, the details there, but so is the noise. And if we process that, of course, we would just stretch the noise and stretch the signal. So as I'm sure you know, as, as keen astronomers, you then stack the images one on top of each other. So this is a stack of the best 2000 uh, frames. And again, you can see there's still not a lot of detail coming in there, but you've got this, uh, um, you've lost that sort of grainy image now. And then we put it in the program called Registax. Registax has all these sliders. And that's when the detail starts to appear and the color comes back in as well. And I say, you start to notice details that you couldn't see when we were looking at it through, through the camera or through the eyepiece as well, all this sort of fine detail, little storms down in the uh, temperate zones, 
the moon's just appeared as well. So all this fine detail that really is below the resolution of the eye uh, does come out with the camera as well. And I see my technique is to maybe take five or 10, you know, one after the other, refocus, take a picture, refocus, take a picture. And, uh, you know, you can then pick the sharpest uh, frames to, to put together and the sharpest frames of all those to put together. Mark, can I quickly just oh. ask you what the resolution of those videos was? Uh, what do you mean by resolution? Pic uh, the, 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 um, the pixel capture, the, was it six by four, 600? Oh, I'd have to go. Yes, yeah, so that's a good point then. So what I do is I use this region of interest up here. Now with my ASI 224, that's 1300 by 1900 pixels. So when I'm trying to find the planet, I leave it on the maximum. I use the max. And that gives me the maximum field of view. So I get it nicely lined up. Now if I then record at that full whack, I'm just recording loads of black that doesn't have any detail in. And so what Fire Capture does, it lets you choose your ROI, region of interest, the other, what I've got there, 640 by 480. Uh, so in there, when I press that button, it'll go to that size around, around the planet. And what it does, it means that I'm then only saving, saving 200 frames a second, but at a much smaller size. And then it means the USB doesn't have so much pressure and the camera drive, uh, hard drive on the uh, computer doesn't have so much pressure to store so much detail. Does that answer your question? Yes, great, thanks. Yep, yep, okay. So yes, yeah, so when I'm imaging the moon, I tend to use the full frame because the moon rotates so slowly, you know, once every 28 days. I'm not worried about features moving long, but on Jupiter, which rotates in, in only 10 hours, you really want to be at two, two and a half minutes maximum before you'll actually start to see a small amount of image rotation that'll affect the image. So the second effect we've got to be careful of when we're planetary imaging is atmospheric dispersion. And, you know, this is another thing that I'm sure the atmosphere, it must be wonderful life, but it's very hard for astronomy. Um, so the light enters the atmosphere from these planets, of, or from a star or from anything, and the atmosphere acts like a prism and it disperses the red and blue lights at differing angles, much like a prism does. And it causes our nice clean image to spread out into red and blue fringes. Now, a few weeks ago, was that end of May, uh, we had a nice evening apparition of, of Mercury when we last had some clear skies. And I caught these images on separate nights, 26th and 28th of May. So the first night I went out, I set up properly and uh, I managed to get it all, all captured. And I used this thing called an atmospheric dispersion corrector to re, and this has little prisms inside and you twiddle these levers, levers and the prisms line up in just the right way that you reset the light back so it's nice and parallel and you realign that red and blue. This is the ZWA model. Um, you can spend a lot more um, and it seems to have much the same effect. And the next night then on the 28th of May, I thought, I wonder what happens if I don't use the ADC? What, what benefit is this bringing to me? Uh, maybe I can use this in a talk. So I took a picture without the ADC of Mercury at 13 degrees altitude. And you can see there you get this really nice spectrum. Now that's, even with the eyepiece, uh, when I was lining up, it was unobservable. And yet using this ADC for 100 pounds or whatever it was, 120 pounds, now means that you can actually capture detail uh, at a much lower altitude than, than without it. And it doesn't matter if you're using a camera or an eyepiece, that ADC works just the same. It'll give you that benefit, whether you're visual or um, using a camera. And it's important to note that dispersion increases as the planets get lower. So particularly as they start setting in the case of Mercury here, but with the planets being so low over the, in, in the sort of summer skies, as uh, Jupiter, for example, is at opposition, I think it's about now, isn't it? Beginning of July and Saturn's at opposition uh, later on. So that the, the summer ecliptic is so low at night. Um, so you, you, I'd recommend an ADC as well. My plan to, you know, move to the, to the Canaries has been rejected. Um, the Caribbean was also rejected. Uh, and the argument was it was much cheaper for me to get an atmospheric dispersion corrector than it was to relocate the family somewhere much further south where the planets would be higher in the sky. 
So I thought it'd be a good idea to talk you through what I've got set up in my shed. And I'm using the lessons I've learned from using the six inch as a travel telescope, you know, in Milton Keynes, out in the front of the, in the driveway where I can see the lower planets as I get ready to observe Mars in, uh, in the autumn. Now my wife calls this picture the just one more thing. Actually, she calls it much worse than that, one more thing. So as I mentioned earlier, I borrowed a camera from a friend, uh, enjoyed imaging, and then got permission to buy my own. So there's the camera there. It's a one-shot color camera. I'm trying to be simple. I couldn't be bothered to buy a filter wheel and filters um, and, and, and do all the sort of tri-color imaging. So I just went for a one-shot color camera. And to be honest with you, I can't see the difference. I, uh, I, I know sort of five, 10 years ago, people were saying, you know, shooting uh, different bands was the way forward. But with the advances in the electronics inside the camera and the algorithms that go with it, there's a very small difference now. And I find the effects of the atmosphere or the dispersion of the poor seeing um, have a far greater effect than um, the difference between a black and white, uh, you know, shooting through filters and shooting through a one shot color. So I went for the, for the color camera uh, for practical reasons. So I didn't have to worry about uh, you know, getting filter wheel and filters. And I then found out I did need to buy a filter. I had to buy an infrared cup filter. The camera is very cheap, it's very sensitive into the infrared and it causes this, this smearing. You get the red light, uh, the infrared light uh, coming through as well. So you need a filter, to, you know, it's only another 30 pounds or so just to, to put on, to screw onto the front of that and make the image a little bit, a bit sharper. So I just got permission to buy the camera and then had to go out and say, Can, oh, do you mind if I spend a little bit of money on a filter? And then I thought, God, the images are a bit, bit small, you know, compared to what other people are getting. Um, and so, you know, I'm imaging at F10 with this telescope um, and uh, a Barlow lens was, was therefore required to get the focal ratio up to F20, which is about, it's a little bit higher than it needs to be, but uh, it's, it's not too bad. So, um, of course, I had to buy a Barlow lens as well. And luckily this is from Astrofest and they were at Exeter Display on Outer Astro Stand. So I bought a Barlow, as well, Barlow lens as well, a nice two inch Barlow lens uh, to magnify that image. Uh, so that I can um, get that nice image scale on the camera chip. And then the issue is on the on, on the Celestrons, on the C11s uh, and on the Meads as well, is that it focuses by moving the primary mirror up and down. So it flops around. It's not a very elegant mechanism. And so uh, I had to then reapply for more permission to buy a Crayford focus, so an aftermarket focus that then screws on and has a nice fine focus on there so that the focusing was much easier. And the problem was with that, that every time I touched the telescope, uh, even with the nice focus lever, because it's got this huge imaging train on it, and I've now got a Barlow, so I'm imaging at F20, the whole thing jiggles around every time I went to go and touch the focuser. So I said, to, I said, well, obviously, I now need to go and buy a motorized focuser, and that was, you know, hundreds of pounds. So I bought a, a Skywatch or autofocuser, which has got to be the most awfully named product ever, because the only thing that works automatically is that you have to reach the buttons to press it. Um, and I mounted on my 3D printer, put that on there. Uh, so I now have a motorized focuser on the telescope as well. So I can have a hands-free, vibration-free focusing to get that, that fine detail just right. Um, and of all the features I put on the telescope, I must admit a motorized focuser has made a massive difference. So bearing in mind, um, six months uh, ago, I just bought the, the, the camera, and I bought a filter, and an aftermarket focuser, the Barlow, and now the motorized focuser. I then found that because it's F20, um, despite being able to focus really nicely, I found that I found it really hard to get the planets on the camera chip. And what, of course, you're looking at is quite a small field of view with all that, that magnification. And although I can line up with an eyepiece, you then have to lock the axes, lock the clamps, remove the eyepiece, put the camera back in, refocus, and hope you're still lined up. And inevitably, it's wandered off ever so slightly, just a smidge, and you're now not looking in the right place. So I bought a flip mirror, a relatively cheap one, and it comes down, it has a little mirror, the light comes down, it has a little mirror inside this body, and it reflects the light up to the eyepiece. And when you're nicely lined up, you, you flick a switch that's on the other side, and that, that lifts the mirror up, and then the light comes all the way through, and now onto the, onto the camera. So I, I gone and bought all this sort of stuff. And I said, I said, for goodness sake, not another thing. You, you only went to buy a camera a few months ago. And I said, you're not going to believe this. Of course, the, the planets are so low now. I, I now need this atmospheric dispersion corrector as well. Um, so that was my, what my wife calls just the, just the one more thing. Now, you don't need to buy all this straight away, but it certainly has made my 
planetary imaging much easier just by doing this. And I bought a few, you know, one every few months I go out and buy a little upgrade. Um, and of course I have to highlight this is before I bought the telescope, the mount, the laptop and the observatory. Um, I say I only went to go and buy a camera and now look what I've got hanging off the back of the telescope. So that's the, the why I enjoy observing and the, the how. I'm now going to just use some of the highlights I've captured of the, of the solar system just to, to finish off. And this is little Mercury and I really struggle to capture any details on Mercury. It's so small and only visible briefly. That was an image I took in when we were up on, um, on Tidy in 2018. And that's the best image I've got and you can't, it's just a tiny little crescent. And then I remembered that I took this picture and I hope that's coming through okay, it looks quite washed out. That was the Mercury transit in 2016. I just managed to catch Mercury on the edge as it went past the, uh, the prominence. And if you remember earlier, the picture of the, the moon and Saturn, if you remember, of course, the moon is the same angular size as the sun. That's why we get solar eclipses. That just gives you an idea of how small Mercury is uh, compared to the disk of the sun. And remembering, of course, that's Mercury at its closest to the Earth when it's between the sun and the Earth when you get these transits. So it just gives you an idea of how small Mercury is. It's not much bigger than the moon and obviously much, much further away. Uh, moving out to Venus, um, that's a picture I took uh, that was published in astronomy now a few weeks ago. And Venus is an inner planet as well. So it, it's between us and the sun. And when it's on the far side of the sun, you get to see a lot of the, a lot of the surface. It's lit up by the sun and it undertakes us on the inside and gets nearer and nearer. So it gets larger and larger. And then we get to see more and more of the of the nighttime sign as this crescent face grows and grows and grows. Uh, this is this is Mars. I've really struggled to get a, a, a good picture. Um, that was through the 20 inch Mons with that much higher resolution. That's my best picture of Mars I've got uh, with the infrared and with the optical. And that's what I got um, with the C11 uh, back in the UK a bit later on, so much smaller. Um, but it was really hard just to see anything because Mars was so, so tiny. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to having a, a, a good run of Mars uh, this autumn uh, with the telescope. And Mars will be much higher up in the sky, uh, 30 to 35 degrees if I remember right. That's a screenshot from Sky Safari on the night of opposition. Uh, so Mars will be just under um, the square of Pegasus in Pisces, so easy to find. And Jupiter is really where the action is. Jupiter rotates in 10 hours. So if you see a feature on Jupiter here, as it rotates round uh, two and a half hours later, it's already on the meridian. And then two and a half hours later, the feature will be disappearing off the side. And one of the things I want to do is Jupiter returns to the winter skies when the nights are much longer, is to be able to do a full 10 hour observation of Jupiter, maybe take a picture every 10 minutes or or make some notes every 10 minutes and watch Jupiter do a full rotation, capture it all from one side of the sky to the other. And of course you get the four moons as well, four bright moons. These are what we're seeing in the binoculars right back at the beginning. Now, one of the things I've also enjoyed and you saw earlier was taking a time-lapse picture. So if you take a picture every five minutes or two minutes, you can stitch them together and make a little, little GIF or an AVI into a movie. And this was taken in 2015 uh, through an infrared filter. And it's Jupiter, um, south is at the bottom. We've got the great red spot just there. And we've got uh, Io and Ganymede down here as well. So I'll, do, I'll press play and it starts off. You'll start to see Jupiter rotating and then I'll put the Barlow lens in and we increase the magnification. So Jupiter's rotating, the moons are getting closer and closer. And it was actually an occultation. I can't remember which one went past which. But you can actually see the size difference. I'll pause it when it gets to the end next time. I just love this. So you get to see celestial dynamics uh, in the garden in real time. So there they are, the two, the two moons going past each other. So if I pause it just there, you can see there that's Io and that's Ganymede. And you can actually see the angular size different, Io being smaller than Ganymede. You know, Ganymede being much larger. Um, so yes, that was taken with, you know, from a, from a garden in southern England, you know, the, here you are, here's two, two, moons, Jupiter, two moons of Jupiter, uh, one occulting the other. Uh, Saturn's always a joy, always a, a beautiful sight to see. 
Um, it doesn't really have a lot going on its surface though, certainly when you compare it to Mars, um, with all its, its desert features and Jupiter with its ba atmospheric bands and storms and satellite phenomena. Um, so yes, yeah, Saturn when it returns to the winter sky is going to be always beautiful. Uh, at the moment the wings, the, wing, the, the rings are, are wide open so we get to see it like that looking down on the surface. And in 2025, the Earth is going to get closer and closer and closer. In 2025, we'll actually cross the ring plane. So Saturn will actually get more and more and more edge on. And then in March 2025, um, we'll actually cross the ring plane. It's, it's quite a unique event because you get to see Saturn with a tiny little sliver. You might see a little bit of a shadow of the rings. But you do actually get to see the moons in the rings um, lit up as well because they're larger diameter than the rings are. And in December of this year, fingers crossed we get some clear skies, Jupiter and Saturn are going to um, have a conjunction. They're going to join past each other. This is the night of their closest approach on December the 21st. So fingers crossed for clear skies. So even this is just on Sky Safari with a low power eyepiece, you'll be able to see the four moons and several moons of Saturn in the same field of view. So fingers crossed. I think it's visible like that for several days either side. Obviously, that's a nice of closest approach. Um, so it'd be a beautiful sight to see. Goodness knows what the astrologers are going to make of this uh, with a you know this beautiful evening star at Christmas time. Now going back to making time lapses, this is going right out to the far end of the solar system. This is Uranus and, and its moons. It's a composite image. Uh, Uranus is uh, magnitude six, so visible with binoculars. But the moons are way fainter down at magnitude 14. Um, there's actually five you can see with amateur telescopes. There's a little one called Miranda that's fainter but much closer in. I couldn't, I've never seen it either visually or with the camera. And we had a clear run of good nights from the end of November. I feel I put the wrong date in, it should obviously be 2019. We had a run of good nights, clear nights at the end of November last year. And I went out and imaged the moons, imaged, imaged Uranus and caught the disc and then went to that and photographed the moons as well. So what I'm going to do is press play and we'll see the moons as they go around. I just love the fact that, I know that's with the with the 11 inch, uh, the session on C11, but just the fact that you can see the moons of Uranus orbiting in real time, you know, from my garden in, in southern England. And I did the same night, Uranus and Neptune are both quite close to each other in the evening sky. Uh, coming back in the autumn and Neptune when we think the light from the Sun takes eight minutes to get to the earth it takes four hours for the light to come from Neptune uh, back to the earth so it's it is a long long way uh, to, to Neptune that's why it's so small it's obviously a, a much bigger planet than the earth but it's so much further away two arcs, just over two arc seconds in diameter, and it has a, a relatively bright moon, Triton, it's covered in ISIS, so it's relatively bright for, you know, it's 2,000 uh, kilometers or nearly 3,000 kilometers in diameter. And its orbital period is just under six days. So on the same time, same nights I photographed Uranus, I was photographing Neptune as well. And there's this field star here that I used for reference to make sure the frames lined up. As the nights go on, there's a bit of a jump, you can tell which nights were cloudy. So yeah, you get to be able to see, you know, the moon and Neptune four light hours away from the Earth as it orbits around as Triton orbits Neptune. So that's, that's the talk. Thank you for having me. I've described how to use binoculars to sketch an image. Uh, in this case, the moons of Jupiter. I've talked through my equipment for planetary observing. I've talked through the importance of seeing and atmospheric dispersion, the techniques we can use to manage that. I've talked through high speed imaging, the lucky imaging of how to capture those high resolutions, and then showed you some examples of time lapse imagery uh, to capture those footage there. So thank you for having me. I'm happy to take any questions.